of God is relatively simple to understand if you just believe what it says. <coughs> it's when we begin to interpolate things and add our own ideas and our own conjectures and so forth to get into a big jumbled mess. He said himself that this generation looks for a sign. And he said there'll be no sign given to it, the human generation. He said, except one. I think about that statement so many times. He is guaranteeing one sign, although he gave hundreds. But he put himself on record saying, I'm going to give one sign whereby he can verify and validate who I am. He referred back to an Old Testament story and a character named Jonah. Probably the most disputed story in the Old Testament about a man who was called to go preach to a city, rebelled against God, did not go to the city God told him to go to, took a ship, paid his fare, and went to a city in the opposite direction. When he got on the ship, a storm came up. And this storm was so violent, you have to put yourself back out on the ship. If you've ever been in a storm at sea, we can appreciate the story much better. It was so violent that the men began to throw their cargo overboard. What's so important about that? That's their paycheck. It's funny when your life is involved, money means nothing at all. They would gladly lose their house. They had a car back then, they lose their car. They would lose their possessions to save their life. It shows the severity of this storm. This storm was life threatening. I have heard stories of ships at sea. I was in the Navy and we were in a hurricane one time for three days coming up the East Coast. The way ships are put together, they're welded in certain sections and so forth. But the ship is in a storm on a particular course going contrary to the wave that swells, a ship can snap like a twig. I remember our captain in the storm. He said, let's change course to get a better ride and preserve the safety and integrity of the ship. At that time, I couldn't imagine a still ship being broken by water. But it can happen. But it shows how true the story was. They threw all the cargo overboard, hoping to save the light of the ship and whereby it would ride high in the waves and the chance of sinking would be less likely. These men were sinking. They were going to go down. Jonah finally confessed that they all began to pray and call upon their gods. And Jonah finally confessed that this storm because of me. It was an isolated storm. The, the port they came out of was a busy seaport. You're passing ships coming in as you're going out. And captains of ships, they communicate with these, these days, because you have weather channels and weather stations and radar and so on and so on and so forth. And you can look at the weather before you go. But back in those days, it was word of mouth. And as you pass the ship, they would tell you what to expect when you got out there. Now, one ship they passed gave warning of a storm. Now, sad they had the ships they passed going out Ships in the past coming in, someone would have said something. They would have said, turn around, go back, because you'll lose everything you have. You'll lose your ship, you'll lose your life. We didn't have a report like that. So the storm God brought off, just brought about, just involved that ship only, because of a man named Jonah. Jonah finally confessed that he was the reason why. He said, the only way God's going to be at peace is to throw me overboard. 
Nobody in the right mind would do that. Think about that for a minute. Nobody's going to volunteer to be killed, to drown, if it's not necessary. Jonah knew the reason for the storm. He said, God's after me, not you guys. This is after you threw everything over, that they lost everything. Then it says that they find me. They didn't do it right away. They just grabbed Jonah and threw him over. I think those men prayed some more. They deliberated. Say that uh, as a, by nature superstitious. And he had some who said, well, maybe he's right. Let's do it. He had others. The worst thing that the captain can experience is a man overboard. I'm sure the captain didn't just say, oh, okay, okay, let's, let's do that, John. I'm sure that captain thought long and hard about it. In the meanwhile, trying to preserve his ship and his own life. And when you throw someone overboard, a man falls overboard. You don't just throw them overboard and go about business as usual. They all, the whole crew watched him. And they watched him go into the waves. They watched Jonah go down. Perfect picture, and you get a picture in your mind. Think about that movie, The Perfect Storm. He wouldn't come back, he wouldn't come back up again. Story behind Jonah is that Jonah died. He drowned. And after he was dead, the story says the Lord prepared a great fish and swallowed Jonah. The story has been known, or could be known as Jonah and the whale. There's nothing like that in the Bible. You should call it Jonah and the fish. There's a special fish. I told you about this movie show I saw recently. Megadon or something like that. It's a super, super prehistoric shark that they discovered in the ocean originally. And this, this shark supposedly can, can almost swallow, this shark as well rather, and almost swallow a shark. It's a whale, right? So a picture of a, they're taking a bite off of a whale, a whale's tail, and bit the whale almost in half. And that's a huge fish. Well, a man would just disappear. The fish served as a coffin to preserve the body of Jonah. Now much speculation, and this is brought about by Satan himself, has risen about the fact that no man <clears throat> could live three days and three nights in the belly of a fish. Who said he did? Satan is, is known, renowned for pointing his finger at the obvious wrong as a way of taking a person's mind and putting it in the wrong direction. So much of the story has been poo-pooed by those who read it as impossible because it's, he couldn't live. The whole point of the story is to tell this man died. <coughs> Swallowed up after he was dead. Then he comes back to life again and the whale vomits him out three days three nights, 72 hours, to be specific, later. When Jonah was spewed out from the mouth of this fish on dry land and brought back to life again by God, he made a beeline to Nineveh, where God told him to go in the first place. But put flesh and blood on this story. This story is out there. This covered the entire sea coast. This story had gone around the known world of that day. And had a three day, three night head start. The men of Nineveh, they heard about the story. The men of the sailors that came back alive said, no, there's, there's a man on our ship, we had to throw overboard. And when we threw him overboard, he said that God told him to go and preach to your city and tell your city he's going to destroy it. And he said, if you throw me overboard, at least God will save your life. We threw him overboard, and we're here to tell you the story. 
we're alive, but there's a man that leads you overboard with a message from God to you that God's going to kill you. You can't take that lightly. If you're a Ninevite, that should put terror in your heart. Right then. You don't sleep anymore. You don't rest easy anymore. And you gotta wonder about this guy and wonder who's gonna replace him and when's this message gonna get to us again. But you know, you've been on, you've been alerted, you've been warned. God's gonna take you a lot. Right? How can you rest easy? How can life be normal to that after this story and the world? Knows about it that you're God's target, you're in God's crosshairs. And all of a sudden, three days, three nights later, this man comes walking into your city. Same guy. Identifiable. Saying, yes, in 40 days, God's going to destroy your city. Would you believe him? Better believe you would. Well, that's the story Jesus used. He said, I'm going to give you one sign. Be the sign of Jonah. And as Jonah's in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, I'll be in the heart of the earth or in the grave three days and three nights. Jesus died just as sure as Jonah died. You have these stories that he was, he, that he passed out and was resuscitated. So, so far. Trust me, you don't come back after a run of crucifixion. They put nails in his hands and his feet, stuck a spear in his side, he was bleeding from the back for being whipped, had a crown of thorns in his head, he was bloodless. You lose your blood, you lose your life. Just that simple. And for him to come back again, having nothing but an act of God, period. That's the sign that Jesus chose to use as proof that he was sent from heaven by God to save the world. And to reject that message from Jesus was a signing of your own death warrant. You will die. Plain and simple. The time frame is important. Three days and three nights. Jesus is up in the grave three days and three nights. So here we have the preparation day and the Sabbath drew on. The point I'm trying to make here in this particular lecture is that this preparation day is not Friday as commonly supposed and the Sabbath day is not Saturday as supposed. But let's pretend it is. If it were and Jesus said himself three days and three nights Jesus joined us a pattern so he died at 12 o'clock noon Friday, which is when the church celebrates his death on Good Friday. I don't understand where the term came from itself, Good Friday. Nothing good about it. The results were great, but the death wasn't. Ask his mother, was it Good Friday? Ask his disciples, was this a good day? They'll tell you not at all. Right? If it's true, though, he died at noon on Friday as churches worship and have a special service. It's one day around the world where people are able to get off work early to go observe Good Friday, Christianity in particular. Well, Saturday at noon will make one day. Sunday at noon will be two days. Monday at noon will be three days, three nights. That would make Easter Resurrection, commonly referred to as Resurrection Sunday, totally out of whack. Had to be on a Monday. You agree? So we have to understand what the reference is, he says, the preparation day and the Sabbath day. Follow me? Now there's a scripture in John, turn there. We're going to hit this in small increments. Okay, but I want you to understand. These days, again, have a direct reference to the rapture in the time of the rapture. I'm going to material that the church has been denying and rejecting for a long time, not realizing that God is alive, that Jesus is alive, 
referred to as that prophet of the Old Testament, and he speaks from heaven. And that's what makes the Bible different than any other book. It's not a book you learn in the sense of having read it. And now I know that. It's a living document written by a living spirit subject to different levels of revelation. Only God himself can reveal. The unregenerated man, the natural man, to the Corinthians, the natural man, he can be the smartest person in the world. It says he cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. Neither can he know them. Impossible. He has to have that spirit that wrote the book and the spirit who speaks the book inside of him to understand the book. Without it, he's just a person grasping, groping in the dark. Right? You can't perceive that. Let's go to John. I call John 21. Keep in mind this is a rule. Every Sabbath day has to have a preparation day. Put that in your notes. John 19. Thirty-one. The Jews, therefore, because there was a preparation, same word again, that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. Now you got a parenthesis here. For that Sabbath was a high day. Very important. Why put that insertion there if it was just a regular, typical, ordinary Saturday? He's telling you here in this note that that Sabbath day was not Saturday, but it was a special Sabbath day. Follow me? Which means clearly that that particular week he died. He had two Sabbath days. Your regular Saturday Sabbath day. If you had two Sabbath days, you had to have two preparation days. The river is Saturday, Sabbath, and the Friday preparation day. Then the other Sabbath day, which we haven't established yet, and a preparation day for that Sabbath day within the same week. Follow me? This is the way the three days and three nights statement by Jesus is going to stand up. For that Sabbath day was a high day. You could just as easily insert there a special Sabbath day. Not a Saturday, but a high day, special day, commonly known as Passover. Right? They saw a pilot that the legs might be broken, that they might be taken away and not remain on the cross. Now you get a real clear clue here. You have a regular Sabbath, Saturday. You have a Friday preparation day. I'm going to tell you right now, your other Sabbath day that week was Thursday. Therefore, your preparation day was Wednesday. Jesus did not die on Good Friday. They put the word good with it. Call it Good Wednesday. He died on a Wednesday. Very, very important link to the resurrection and the rapture itself. Both days will be significant as we continue to study. Wednesday and Saturday. Put those two days in your mind. He's going to do a great event on a Wednesday. Here's another great event on Saturday. Let's go back to Matthew and look at something that I've been in church over 50 years. I haven't heard anybody preach on it.
the day Christ died. 